Welcome to this Device Pilot webinar, Beyond the Hundreds. So our audience today is really companies who have deployed hundreds of connected devices there or thereabouts uh, and are aiming at lots more. And the deliverables I'm hoping to give you today are a bit of a map showing you some of the things that you might need to do next. And more specifically, a to-do list of a few actions you can take now, which will radically transform your prospects for success as you grow. So first of all, congratulations. Getting devices designed and built and into the hands of your first few hundred customers is a real achievement and has taken a lot of hard work, so well done. But this is also the point where it dawns on you that actually building it was one thing, but running it is another. And you've now got what will be hopefully a growing and exponentially growing estate of connected devices that need to be run. Uh, you need to make sure they're working. You need to make sure they're delivering uh, what the customer's paying for. Uh, and, and so there's still an awful lot left to do to achieve that. And the key point, I suppose, is that a connected product is a service. It's only valuable to the customer if it delivers day on day, week on week, what the customer's actually paying for, if it's actually working. And, and so that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today. So you had some reason for connecting your product. It might be remote control or live billing. There's, there's tens of different reasons that people are choosing to make their devices smart. And that's great, but along with that comes a whole load of other consequences of IoT, consequences of connecting your device. If the device is supposed to be online, then sometimes it will be offline. It will get misconfigured. It will have hardware bugs. It will have plenty of software bugs. It may even sometimes have the wrong software on it, the wrong version of firmware. You will have security issues. You'll need to do updates to address those. There may be physical issues with devices getting damaged. There may be usability issues where customers don't understand how to use the product. All these things and more can distract from the, the core value and the core proposition. And so you have to find a way to, to manage them, to get them under control, to eliminate them as much as possible in order to deliver um, a quality service to your customers. So this is the map I was promising, and we call it the Service monitor Monitoring Maturity Curve. And really, it's a classic S-shaped technology curve uh, going through five stages from R&D, uh, which is fairly self-explanatory, the phase you've just come from, to roll out the phase you're in now, where you're deploying maybe a few hundred, few thousand devices, and then uh, through the stages of inflection and growth, where growth happens really rapidly, until eventually you, you saturate the market. So we're going to have a look at a number of different dimensions or aspects of your company that will change as you go through these phases. And the first one is the most important one, which is people. At some point after you roll out, it will become apparent that devices aren't always doing what they should, customers aren't always happy. And the only solution to this is to make sure that you have somebody appointed to be in charge of that problem, to, who reports to the CEO or the board and has responsibility and, and the mandate to fix whatever the problems are. Uh, and th they may have a title like head of customer or head of customer support or head of operations or head of network, lots of different titles, but essentially they are the person who is entirely customer focused. And over time, of course, uh, they will lead a team of people now, the important factor is that that team cannot grow in proportion to the number of devices you deploy. So if you go from 100 devices this year to 1,000 devices next time, uh, next year, the team can't grow by that same factor of 10, um, but it will still need to grow somewhat. And over time, it will become structured. And usually the way to structure it is that you'll have a frontline uh, team, which you call customer support. They deal with individual problems with devices or individual unhappy customers, and often on a sort of minute by minute or hour by hour basis. Behind them, you'll have second line, which is sometimes called operations. They're dealing with things on a slightly uh, slower um, uh, sort of beat of maybe a, a week or, or so. They're really looking at systemic problems that are occurring. You know, we've got this, this issue with a firmware that's occurring under certain circumstances we need to we need to triage that, we need to root cause it, um, we need to identify how it's going to get resolved uh, and then deploy that resolution into the field. So, so they're taking a slightly bigger picture view of what's going on and building processes and so on. 
And then sometimes there's also a product team that are looking at the, uh, the overall proposition for the customer. What is it supposed to do? Is it doing, is it doing that and feeding that back either into um, product evolution in field, you know, releasing new features with software updates and so on, or possibly uh, into the next version of the product. People do processes, at least to begin with, and uh, the processes that uh, the team will be using uh, in the early days uh, to support devices will be quite ad hoc and reactive. And in the very early days of Roller, that's absolutely fine. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the issues that, that occur will often be novel. There'll be things you haven't seen before, you weren't expecting, and therefore you have no alternative but to just stick a human on the end of that and, and just react to whatever occurs and try and understand it and try and make it good for that customer. Try and keep the wheels on um, uh, so you can go on continuing on the customer journey, continue learning uh, with that customer. Um, and, and that's absolutely fine. But that approach absolutely does not scale um, for the reasons I alluded to uh, previously. You can't, you can't grow your team in proportion to your device's state. So, uh, and if you try, you'll just end up in an awful sort of firefighting situation where um, you know, your team is completely beaten into the ground uh, uh, with, with incoming requests that they don't have the time to handle properly and you're serving the customer really badly because ultimately, um, dealing with every problem as though it's a new problem is just an incredibly inefficient way to behave. Over time, you will start to realize that actually a lot of issues that occur, maybe as much as 80% or more, will, will either have occurred before or are entirely possible to anticipate. So for example, if your devices have batteries, the batteries will run out. Um, so that's something you you could design and plan a, a process for, uh, which will anticipate that, will deal with it and resolve it, you know, and keep the customer happy. So you need to move into a much more sort of planned and orchestrated mode. You also need to become um, much more proactive. So in that battery example, um, rather than waiting for the customer to call up and say the battery's gone flat on my device. Um, you actually want to be proactive. If you see the battery running down, you could perhaps dispatch a battery to the customer um, and, and that transforms a potential issue into actually a really delightful customer experience where the customer can see that you're ahead of the curve. You're looking at things, you're, you're thinking about things, um, you're anticipating their needs. And that, 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 that can really develop a lovely sort of customer uh, relationship. And of course, ultimately, once you have a number of processes set up to to detect and and react to issues, you can you can then start to look at automating them. It, it's hard to automate them until you have defined them really well. But once you have them defined and you have people executing them, uh, you can look at automating them. Um, and to the extent that you can automate them, obviously you'll be able to uh, resolve them much more quickly, leading to happy customers. But you'll also be able to lower your costs because machines are basically uh, cheaper than than humans. And, and you should be spending your humans uh, on the on the long tail of unusual or new problems uh, because humans are very good at doing that sort of thing, and leave the machines to do all the handle cranking. Now people use tools to do processes uh, and in the early days the tools I'll be using will be quite general purpose. Things like sending emails to each other to, to track problems or, or putting things on spreadsheets. And, and again, in those very early days, that's a perfectly appropriate thing to do. But uh, it completely fails to scale. So uh, processes which involve you know, sending emails to each other uh, will cause all sorts of dropped balls where customer problems are, are just um, you know, dropped between people and, and don't get resolved in a timely way. It's also very hard to keep track of what's actually going on. How many problems are you getting? Uh, how quickly are they being resolved? Uh, and so on. And in terms of spreadsheets, as soon as a spreadsheet has more than, I don't know, a thousand devices or something on it, it just becomes very hard for, for a human to understand what, what they're looking at. So you naturally tend to then move towards specialist tools. And, and an obvious one would be a, a ticketing tool or a CRM tool, which helps you keep track of every issue either per device or per customer or per job uh, and track it through to resolution so you, you don't drop the balls. And there are plenty of off-the-shelf CRM tools out there which do that very well. 
You'll also need a way to do a triage. So your frontline team, your customer support team will need a way to triage problems, to turn telemetry into insight that helps them understand what's actually going on and what action needs to be taken to resolve a problem. Above that, perhaps your second line people will, will also need a way to do performance management. So you need to understand, well, how well are we serving the customers as a whole? Um, where are the gaps? Um, or how big is the gap? Um, are, you know, are we are we at one hundred percent yet? We won't be. So, wh what are, what are the drivers of all of those problems, uh, and what should we do about them? And and part of that obviously will be reporting. So you'll want to be reporting internally to the company uh, about how well you're doing and whether you're hitting your targets for quality and so on. And as you get large customers, they may force you to report to them about whether you're meeting your service level agreements. So metrics are, are really uh, uh, something to do with reporting. In the early days, your natural tendency will be to have quite technical metrics. So an obvious metric is uptime. The device is supposed to be connected. It's supposed to be maybe sending a heartbeat every five minutes. How often is it doing that across all of your devices? So if you take the last week, um, what percentage of your devices were up for that last week? You know, is it 50%, 90%, 99% or, or whatever? Um, it's a very useful number to measure, uh, and there are a lot of things you can do to improve it. Um, but as time goes on, you realize that actually it's not just it's not enough to do uh, just technical measurements. It's sort of necessary but not sufficient. And you'll want to try and find some metrics which are even closer to customer experience, more commercial metrics. So an example of that would be, say we were deploying electric vehicle charging points into um, a parking lot. We've got, we've got five charging points in a parking lot. Uh, if one of them is broken, then as an EV charging customer, um, I, I arrive at my car. Well, I can't use that one, but if the one next to it is working uh, and available, then I can charge my car. So although there's a technical uptime problem on that site, there actually isn't a commercial availability problem. There's actually 100% availability right now because there's at least one charger available and working. Um, the converse of that situation would be um, that uh, all of the uh, charges are working fine, so there's a hundred percent uptime, so there's no technical problem, but they're all in use. So the next uh, driver to to try and charge their car can't do so. So there's not a technical problem, but it's certainly a commercial problem. Net Promoter Score (NPS) is a classic way to measure customer satisfaction. It's it's usually done um, manually by asking people whether they'd refer you to to a friend, and uh, it's often done. You know, somewhat in arrears, it's quite an expensive process to do. And if, uh, as you often can, you can find metrics that you can measure automatically, which are highly correlated with net, uh, net promoter score, then that's a much better way uh, of driving your business. You want metrics that are live, so you're not looking, you know, you're not always looking at the past and, and trying to steer yourself with reference to the data that's now out of date. And of course, as I said, as you start to get large consolidated channel partners taking taking you to market, then they will probably enforce SLAs on you. And so you need to track SLAs. It might be your performance over every any given month and so on. The top challenge that you're addressing as a company will change a lot as well over time. And in, in the R&D phase, obviously, it's mainly the technical questions about your choice of technologies and actually implementing them. As you go into rollout, then obviously adoption is often a big question. We need to find those early customers to, to use the product, to pay us, to give us that feedback and, and show us what we still need to do. Um, and then as you go into the inflection and growth phases, then quality and growth sort of tend to be the, the top challenges. And they, they tend to be very interrelated actually, because um, it, it's, it's very hard to grow without quality. So if you if you have a problem where 20% of your customers are unhappy, then if you try and grow by a factor of 10, you, you'll have 10 times as many unhappy customers, which will, will probably just completely drown you. So you need to get the quality up in order to grow. But interestingly, there's also a relationship in the other direction. 
because often you need to grow in order to drive quality because if you have say 100 devices in the field it's actually hard to get enough statistical data to diagnose uh, and root cause all of your issues you know if you have a one percent problem then that's one device maybe that's exhibiting that problem and it, it may not um, be repeatable enough or, or you may not have enough information to really get to the bottom of it by the time you've grown to a thousand or ten thousand devices that one device has become a hundred devices and now you're probably getting a lot more insight into the circumstances under which it goes wrong which can help you understand whether it's a you know a, a software problem or a hardware problem or, or whatever uh, and then as you start to saturate the market you'll probably become much more interested simply in your financial margin in squeezing every last penny uh, out, out of out of the proposition and, and making yourself as efficient as possible so that really brings me on to uh, one of three um, things which which vary more gradually as, as you evolve as a company. So in the early days, you will tend to value flexibility a lot because to some extent you're dealing with the unexpected. You're putting a proposition into the hands of your customers for the first time and you don't really know what you'll, you'll find. You may find technical issues, you may find propositional issues. So the ability to be quite flexible and quickly change things is really, really valuable to you and to some extent at, at any cost. So you, know, you don't have that many customers to amortize the cost against. Um, you're still learning. Flexibility is great. Obviously, as the scale gets bigger and bigger, uh, you actually get much more confident in what you're doing. You, you, you get confident that the hardware is right, the software is right, the proposition is right. Um, and, um, and what you get more concerned with is simply efficient efficiency and it actually gets easier to be efficient as you get more confident in the solution because you can you can really nail down uh, every aspect of it and, and uh, find ways to um, to optimize what you're doing um, uh, for efficiency and that's true kind of you know in terms of um, technical costs it's true in terms of team costs and, and everything else another thing that, that changes perhaps somewhat gradually is your operational focus. So as I said at the beginning, in the early days, you'll be really focused on building it, designing it, building it, getting your, your devices deployed into the real world, into the hands of customers. And sometimes it's hard to think beyond that. You just need to get those things out and you'll be measuring yourself simply by shipping stuff. But that that is absolutely not enough. That's not where the story ends. In many ways, it's where the story starts for a connected device because you then need to deliver an excellent service for your customers day by day, week by week. So you go from focused on, on build to being focused on, on running it. And, and that becomes an exponentially bigger problem uh, that you need to manage. And finally, another aspect of the business that will will uh, evolve and often quite gradually uh, is, is your business model. If you come from a historical perspective of, of selling um, unconnected products or dumb products, uh, then you may have a business model which is a one-off sale. So um, if I buy an ice cream, I, I pay the money, I get the ice cream, I eat it, and, and that's the end of it. Um, but obviously, uh, connected devices are intrinsically not like that. I mean, they intrinsically uh, deliver service uh, continuously and they have costs uh, to support them. Um, and not just customer support, but uh, you know, updating the software to, to deal with security issues or, or evolving standards or whatever. So there is intrinsically a cost in delivering any connected product. Um, and therefore, it's often a good idea to try and find a business model um, that that matches that and, and often you can um, because you are delivering value on an ongoing basis um, and, and so the propensity to move to delivering things as a service um, uh, is, is happening in the world generally um, so instead of delivering uh, making heaters you might sell heat as a service or comfort as a service for example um, so so this is just happening in the world anyway and it's extremely connected to iot because iot is a great way to deliver it and iot because the costs and value are delivered continuously is just a natural fit for it anyway so sort of trying to find recurring revenue business models um, more service-like business models uh, is often something that people kind of want to do so that was the map. The second thing I promised you was a to-do list, really something you can you can focus on in the short term to really make your life easier. And, and really, I've got three things to suggest. The first one is simply to measure your service quality. You may 
you may have some idea of the kinds of uh, issues uh, that you're having, some sort of anecdotal information, um, but really that's not good enough. Uh, and we've seen plenty of situations where people have fooled themselves that um, uh, you know that a problem is the most important problem and it needs to be fixed, and they, they spend a lot of time and effort fixing it, and then discover that actually it was only really affecting 1% of customers. It's not that, that big a deal. Um, and maybe they, they, they left another issue, which is affecting half their customers. Um, so, so when I say measure, I mean actually actually measuring you know, in, in numbers uh, how well you're serving your customers, how happy your customers are. The second thing then is that you know once you've done that, you can then identify and fix those issues and, and improve your quality step by step in a kind of rational way. And the third thing really is this thing of being being proactive. I mean, it, it's easy to say, it's harder to do, but if you come from a background where you you wait for the phone to ring uh, with a customer complaint, then you know there is so much opportunity to become proactive with IoT to use that live telemetry stream to spot problems before the customer knows perhaps that they've even happened uh, and certainly transform your relationship with your customer, transform the uh, quality of experience that the customer's having. Um, you know, there are massive benefits to your customer, but also to you of doing that. It can make you into a much, not only a much better company in terms of the product you serve, but also uh, into a much more efficient company that's really on the front foot. Uh, so it's really think it, worth thinking about ways to, to, to start to transform yourselves. So on that first point, really, in terms of measuring service quality, I mean, just to kind of paint a little bit of a picture around that, ultimately what you're trying to do is measure how many customers are happy. And uh, the, the, the shorthand they use for that in the telco world is, is nines. They talk about um, maybe achieving five nines, which means that 99.999% of the time uh, their, their stuff's working. And they, those are the kinds of numbers that telco can hit. Frankly, the hundreds of devices deployed, we often see people struggle to reach 90%. Um, and and at, at a larger scale, 99% is probably a, a more realistic uh, target to hit. And there's usually plenty to do to, to achieve those levels. And, and, and once you're measuring that, you can then start to look at the gap and start to break that down. How much of that gap is being driven by software issues, by hardware issues, comms issues, usability, and so on. And then break down each of those categories. You know, of all the software issues we've got, how much is to do with version 1.3's propensity to um, you know, become disconnected when it gets too hot or something? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, and you, you can you know, just relentlessly break it down, break it down, work out um, the, the root cause, uh, work out how many customers it's affected affecting what percentage of your uptime or availability it's damaging and therefore prioritize it uh, and, 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 and resolve it, deploy the fix uh, and, and nail that problem. So I hope that's been a, a good, if, if slightly whistle-stop tour of uh, some of the ideas of, of things you might want to be thinking about as you go beyond the hundreds. Um, obviously, Device Pilot, that's what we do. We help companies through this stage and beyond with a suite of tools that can empower um, the customer support and operations team to deliver fantastic customer service. And we'd love to talk to you at any time. Thank you.